Harbinger <laughs> never ends. No. You got to do Harbinger too someday because it would. there's so much that hasn't been written down of yes, the Harbinger since it happened. Yeah. This yeah. show over yeah. the years. Now you have just kept bringing and bringing. The stories are yeah. beyond anything. Yes. Yeah. It keeps going. It keeps going. It keeps going. Well, here's here's the new development. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> for those who don't know, one of the Harbingers, and you'll know it here, the seventh Harbinger is called the Erez tree. Yeah. It's the tree that was planted, Isaiah 9:10. we will plant cedars in their place. The sycamore has been struck down in the attack. We will plant cedars in their place. It's a, it's a symbol. Of, Israel did it. The attack saying, We're gonna, you're not going to humble us, God. We're coming back stronger than ever. This tree is a symbol. We're coming back stronger. Well, it happened in America. It happened after 9-11 that the same tree was planted in place of the fallen sycamore. For those who don't know, you know, you'll, you'll know, you'll know it. it yeah. <laughs> and, and so they planted this. The seventh harbinger was this Erez tree, same tree, and it planted the same thing. And it was a symbol. America's coming back stronger, this whole thing. And it was called the Tree of Hope. We're coming back. And now I've shared in some of the updates when I came back yes. that in the Bible, one of the signs of the judgment of a nation is the withering away of a tree. And when you go, to not, you go down to ground zero, you would see a tree, no matter what they tried to do, that tree of hope was withering away. Mm -hmm. A symbol of a, a nation that was withering spiritually, even though yes. it still stands. Another sign of judgment was the branch. He said, God says, I will break off the branches mm -hmm. of the tree. Another sign of national judgment. Go down there, you'll find the branches cut off of the tree. Right. And, but another sign of judgment is specifically, you'll find it throughout the scripture, is the destruction of the cedar tree. Now, now God says, you know, because the cedar, it, it, in Hebrew, it means strength. Mm -hmm. And so, so if the, it's one thing for the sycamore to, to fall. But if the cedar tree is destroyed, then that means strength. That means you're really closer to judgment. Because God says, literally says, I will bring judgment against the cedar, the cedars of oh. Lebanon, the cedar, all those things will be strong. You see it in Scripture again and again and again. Now, Cedar in Hebrew is Erez tree. It's really Erez tree. That's what's at ground zero. Well, so here is what I'm sharing here now. Okay. Since I was last here, the seventh harbinger has fallen. The Erez tree has fallen. The seventh harbinger is, has been destroyed. <clears throat> the sign of national judgment, the destruction of the Erez tree which it is, it's even hinted in the harbinger mm -hmm. that that's going to happen. It happened since it happened in the spring, and it happened on a very particular They took it down because they, there was no way this thing, no matter what they did, nothing happened. They took down the tree. If you go there, you will not find it. They took it down. They took it down on the day where that night was a Hebrew holy day, oh. was Passover. Oh. The Erez tree has fallen, the, which is a deeper, even a deeper sign than the striking of the sycamore because this, is, this means strength. If this goes, you're closer to judgment. So here it was taken, on, and let me give you more on that. They took it down that day, and the following day, they destroyed it. I mean, they wiped it out. They destroyed it. They ground it. They destroyed it. So they took it down. That day that they destroyed it was Passover, and that night was the first blood moon. Oh, my land. The harbinger fell the day before the blood moon and was destroyed the day, the day of the blood moon. Whoa. And, yeah. you know, people said, well, well, what happened? They didn't see things happening. Well, not that we have to, but that happened. The harbinger fell and the harbinger was destroyed at the time of the blood moon, the beginning. So you're saying this destruction of the cedar tree is a sign that judgment's near. The, the, more than the sycamore. The sycamore is, the, the cedar tree is, represents strength. It's the strong thing. It's the strong, high, lofty tree. Yes, it's a sign we are nearer. And on a Hebrew holy day. So, people are saying, well, I didn't notice anything happen during the blood moons. <laughs> oh, boy. The We've heard more that than said. they know happened during the, the blood moons. Yeah. yeah. These, the, this is the beginning. The, yeah, and the harbinger and the blood moons came together, you know, you know, on that day. On that day. And we didn't know it wow. I mean, until right soon after. We just, God made sure that we found out. We even talked to the gardener and all that. We, we happened to find out. And they, and they uh, I won't quote, you know, I won't say who said it down there, you know. But someone asked, are you going to put up another tree? And, they, and one of them, someone was told, no, 
because of this book called The Harbinger. Because people come from all over, have become all over from America to see that tree. <laughs> Another actual article right here that's confirming what you're saying because it says LA earthquake, the big one, may be on its way after the 4.2 magnitude quake that LA just had. Wow. And so they're well, saying. A, when, just in the last 24 hours? Yes, actually, it says a 4.2 magnitude earthquake which rocked LS, er, Los Angeles on Sunday could have been a precursor to a feared big one quake, one scientist has claimed. So this just happened? Yes, and they're saying after watching all the earthquakes that they're starting to get bigger and bigger in different various locations. And so now in they're L saying. In LA area, especially. Yes. That they're saying they're not so, able to predict so John, them, but it's saying that it, they'll be bigger ones coming. You understand earthquakes as well. They're one of the main signs from Christ. When he said, here's the list. Mm -hmm. When you see all these things, you have to have the whole list, though. And that when these begin to happen, look up, your redemption draws near. I believe that this blood moons is one of God's great final big flashing red lights. Well, it was a red light, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it turned the whole moon red. But these are the flashing lights of prophecy that God's saying it's time. And I believe we don't have many more months to literally prepare in a period of pro prosperity. Would you say that? Yeah, I actually, you know, in my notes I said, and we'll go into this in more detail later, but I actually believe the events of the blood moon are starting to put a time clock on the dots. You know, it's like we've been seeing a whole lot of dots yeah. and we've been seeing how you can connect the dots but what we haven't been able to do is to put a time frame into the dots mm -hmm. and now I'm seeing where you can start seeing a time frame linking into the dots and I'll tell you you know it's like you know the the red light a stoplight yeah. well you know we are all going through life and it's like hustle bustle we're not stopping for anything True. and it's almost like we just came to an intersection and the light turned red mm -hmm. and the Lord is saying stop I need to tell you something mm. and and that's where we're at you believe the Jews are going to during this next period of time that something so major that America is going to be collapsed totally perhaps financially that the Jews who are here who are really the makers and shakers and many of the financial mm -hmm. bankers and leaders that they are going to go back to Israel because it's going to be so bad in the United States. That's what you say in your writings. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, it was prophesied that Israel would go back to its own land. Yes. And it's my understanding that there are as many Jews living in America as what are living in Israel. So the fulfillment... Now? Right now? Yes, right now. So it's almost like the fulfillment mm. of that prophecy is only half filled, fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the fact that on the night of the blood moons, that it's just an unbelievable miracle how God arranged that I would have a certain book with a prophecy from David Wilkerson that was 30 years old that would be right on for right now that it would end up in the pocket of a coat I hadn't worn in a year mm -hmm. and he would tell me by a word of prophecy to go out in the night when I would need a jacket and that I would find that and the word was that I would I was God wanted to give me a word of revelation and when I went in the house and took off the jacket and spotted this book pulled it out and realized this is a prophetic book that is about America. It even, look at the title. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. And 30 years ago, he says in here that he believes that this is imminent. But it's like that night, it was like God told me, now it's imminent. And the description of what but I was directed tragedy, to. There was two calamities to come. And the yes. first one has already taken place. The first destruction happened in like 1992. Crazy prophecy though. That you would never, if you, if you didn't know it already happened, it's crazy yeah. how accurate it was. Yeah. Tell them what it was. Yes. Well, the first, he, he said in this, this earmarked page 
for those that you know didn't watch yesterday's program, yes. this uh, this earmarked page that I found when I found the book, I thought, does the Lord have something in here I'm supposed to read? And I just flipped through it, and one earmarked page on page 14 had a subtitle called "Warning Signs," mm-hmm. and when I read it, he was talking about two destructions. He said a little destruction. Actually, he called them holocausts. Mm-hmm. But, but he was really talking about destructions. He said a little dis- holocaust and a big holocaust. Mm-hmm. And he goes into detail about this little holocaust. And it was describing what would happen seven years later in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. When Saddam Hussein and we had the first Gulf War. And he set the oil fields on fire. And he writes Look about that. that in his book. Remember that? that, that and, the, and they were all in fire. I mean, that, would, that was what you call a holocaust. A holocaust is something major that's, yes. that's, that's flaring up and, yes. and killing people. But mm-hmm. these fields were on fire. Absolutely. And he saw it, what, seven years then? Yes. And, and so uh, we, we won't go on back anymore on no. this. But, but then the next one is about to happen now. Yes. The two he things that he was warning, wrote the book, and the book's in your pocket. Yeah. Inside pocket here. Mm-hmm. And you find it that night of the blood moon. Yes. And the second holocaust is basically the destruction of the United States of yes. America. And basically in, a holocaust in three steps. You know, he is describing there would be a coming economic collapse yes. that would literally cause almost hysteria. It would be unstoppable. Our senators, our government would recognize that it can't be stopped. And this would end up leading to a destruction in America. To the point to where we'd be literally brought to our knees and weakened to such a stage where it says then our enemies would invade us. Mm. And, uh, and when I read this that night, it was like, oh my Lord, this is for now. Mm-hmm. And the Lord, this was the revelation <laughs> yes. that I was supposed to receive that night. and uh, That a prophetic person gave you. Yes. I, I mean, you see this. That's why you need each other. You need people who hear from God to give you advice. And don't just take anybody's advice. And, take only God's advice. So, and when I read this, it dawned on me the significance that this would have. To the blood moons. Mm -hmm. Because you see, it was actually when I was here in November, I was sharing how I believe the event of the blood moons, Mm -hmm. based on previous blood moons, the event would be one of two types. It would be a deliverance and war, or it would be an exodus from a place of harm to a place of safety. You know, this happened in 1492, following those blood moons, where a place of safety in America was opened up. Mm-hmm. And, and then in 1949, or 48 or 49, where the, uh, Israel was reborn, yes. and the persecution that was still in Europe gave the Jews a place to exit from, mm-hmm. to go to a place of safety in Israel. Mm-hmm. And, and I was saying in November that it almost looked like we had both type of events lining up. Mm -hmm. The Psalms 83 war is going to be a great victory for Israel. And and I believe that there would be a coming time where uh, the Jews would exit America to a place of safety in Israel. And, And the night of the blood moons, for me to read about the destruction of Mystery Babylon was a confirmation. Which realized that the event that would follow a blood moon has always in history been one to two years after the fourth blood moon. Well, the fourth blood moon is 2015, which would mean that if the Jews are going to exit America in 2016, and they're going to be doing it because America is falling apart... There's where we start to see timing put into the dots. Now, wasn't the Six-Day War at a blood moon when, when they took back Jerusalem? Yes. Right? So, that was, was that the last t- tetrad 
that was actually during the blood moons. So yes. the, the, the blood moons, the tetrad, happened in 1967 and 1968. And so that particular instance was during the four blood really? moons. Yeah. So, yes. so here we are in the midst now of this one, the last one mm -hmm. that you will ever know. The last you ever see, because with the people living on earth, there's no more. And now you're saying you believe the Jews of America will go back to Israel during this time and, and the mass exodus of the Jews from America. So you can imagine what would cause them, the only thing that has ever caused the Jews to mass exodus is persecution, is yeah. problem. Yeah. You know, is warfare. Yes. You know, Revelation 17 and 18 talks about the destruction of Mystery Babylon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And years ago, when I would read Revelation 18:4, I thought it meant the church, where uh -huh. it says, Come out of her, my people. Yes. But when I was doing my, my book, The Window of the Lord's Return, mm -hmm. you know, I came to the conclusion that come out of her my people my people sometimes refers to the whole church mm -hmm. and there are other times where my people is referring to the Jews uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. and in Revelation 18 4 in the midst of the destruction of mystery Babylon mm -hmm. in fact before its total destruction mm -hmm. it says in 18 4 it says come out of her my people so that you will not share in her sins so that you will not receive any of her plagues well mm -hmm. this is talking about the exodus of the Jews leaving Mystery Babylon. And if you read my book, The Window of the Lord's Return, mm -hmm. I outline very clearly why Mystery Babylon is America. I begin to believe that America is Mystery Babylon, even in those uh, study years I had when I was away. Mm -hmm. And I studied and studied and studied. And then you have come to believe this same thing. Maybe that's why we're friends. We, yeah, and, we're, we're, David, we're in separate places of the world coming to the same conclusions. And David Wilkerson drew the same conclusion. And, and of course, you know, I know that, that you've said that, that the center, the heartbeat of America is New York City. That's right. And, Financial and, capital of the world. And, and that could be the heart that is killed in a sense. That could be the focus of, of America's you know, destruction. I, I just have to say this. This is a picture that I printed off in my computer. This was a few days ago. One World Trade Center. Now, is that not even prophetic enough? The Bible talks about the one yes, world. One world government. Mm -hmm. Government that talks about, warns one us about order. this. Mm -hmm. And what do we do? We have the Twin Towers, which are the World, world Trade Centers, mm -hmm. towers, come down with, I believe, God's warning. God had to let his hand down and the enemies came in. If you read the Bible, you understand that. Right. But then the lightning, last week, the lightning strikes the World Trade Tower and the Empire State Building. Mm. The Empire State Building at the same moment. Oh. There it is, this amazing picture. And God said, that's not an accident. That's my... Lightning, He said, I am trying to send you signals mm. to let you know that these things are happening. And a lot of people won't believe that. But I'm telling you what, you start stacking up the signs. The signs as the Bible talks about in Genesis chapter 1. That when the, the, he, the sun and moon were created to give signals to us. Mm -hmm. And believe me, these signals are happening, John. The mass exodus of the Jews... And so it's going to take something that they literally are freeing, fleeing this country to have a safe homeland. That's kind of, kind of, well, well, you most know. people will not accept that. But that's how bad, according to the scriptures, things are going to get. And Americans are just simply turning their backs on God. We simply have just turned away. We are turned on all the teachings almost of the word of God have been mocked. Mm -hmm. And we're just mocking God. And judgment is going to come unless, the Bible says, unless we repent 
and he says, I'll, I'll hear up in heaven and I'll, I'll heal your land, but it's not yeah. happening. Well, you know, the Jews in America have been very blessed. They're some of the most affluent. They're some of the key leaders. You know, and they own a lot of businesses in America. And it's almost as if when the exodus of the Jews from around the world would go to Israel, it's like the ones that were controlling so much commerce and money in America, they were tied to this country because of the dollar. Well, the Shemitah year is coming. And, uh, and, and many of these prophetic teachers are saying that they're pointing to an economic collapse. David Wilkerson, 30 years ago, prophesied that an economic collapse is coming. And we're seeing the cracks in our infrastructure right now. And we've gone from every, about every seven years... We've mm-hmm. gone from judgment to judgment to judgment to judgment. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. The year and of nine eleven was a Shemitah year. Was a Shemitah year, which is the God's judgment. And there, the the, the yes. horrible thing happened. And, and, and it also, was exactly mm-hmm. to the minute. Yeah. And then also in two thousand and eight was another Shemitah year, and that's whenever we saw a record drop off in our stock market. The the largest crash in seven hundred and seventy seven history. Points. And that was seven years. And then the, 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 it keeps happening. Yeah. And so you're saying uh, uh, the Sumita year is coming. 2015, according to some of the guests that you've had on your program, mm-hmm. are saying that 2015 is the Sumita year. So well, you believe <clears throat> that all of this is saying to you, and it's saying it to me, but I know it's say, he's saying it to you too, that this is the final hours of prosperity for America. You believe that this is the final time to prepare. Absolutely. That by next year, 2015, could be the end of the prosperity as we have known it. Well, you know, um, as I was saying, the blood moons, uh, an exodus event that would be coming up, Mm -hmm. something big would have to happen to cause the exodus event, which means it's pushing the time envelope towards us. Yes. When we get into the five end time wars and we look at the Psalms 83 war that happens before the seven years even starts, you know, if that war happens this year, then that is pushing further towards the envelope of time that we have. Mm -hmm. So it's like right now is the time where there's still money out there. Right. There's still food out there. Yes. It's like people are at ease. You're not at competing ease. with 20 to 50 percent of the population that would be rushing to the stores and rushing to the companies to buy food. Yes. Now is the time because we literally could be down to months instead of years to get prepared. But why do you believe we are in the final hour of prosperity? I keep writing this down. I keep putting arrows there. Uh, the, can you see through the low price of precious metals? And, mm-hmm. you know, because uh, people like it when gold goes up and silver goes up. And, mm-hmm. But you see something different right now. Well, you see, what I'm seeing is precious metals are going down in value. And they go, precious metals spike and go up when the mood and when there's fear that we're heading for a crash. Okay, but right now it's like everybody is preaching this. We're working our way out of it. The housing market is improving. And, uh, and so therefore, people are saying, well, if the economy and the dollar is not going to crash, I better get out of precious metals. And that these people that are believing this babble are getting out of precious metals and precious metals are going down. And then you take a look at the stock market. It's at an all-time high. Uh-huh. And... And, and, you know, there's manipulation in the stock market without going into detail. Uh, it really should not be high where it is. But I will tell you something. Every time the stock market crashes, it's always been at all-time highs. And so it's like if, wow. if the stock market could ever be poised for a crash, it will happen when it's at its highest point and it's there now. You know, so, so we're entering a very serious, dangerous part of well, life, of well, history. The, the good news is, for how, however long it lasts, we're in the lull before the storm. 
-hmm. We're in that period where there's still money that could be had out there. Mm -hmm. And, and you want, I'm going to tell a testimony of, of my own preparation. Okay. Yeah. You know, I've been preparing for a lot more than most of you out there. Yes, yeah. and, uh, and, and because of my study into the five end time wars, I'm realizing I need to prepare to a higher level than where I'm at right now. Wow. And, and I'll go into wow. that detail later on. But, uh, but I am ramping up. And, uh, and, and what, what bothers me... If you're ramping up, then I know we all need to get ready to ramping up. Oh, what, my God. What, what, what kind of makes me nervous, I know a lot of people that are preparing, and, yeah. of course, far more aren't preparing. That's right. But when I talk to people that are preparing, I always ask them this question. How long are you prepared for? Good question. And most Good of them question. are prepared... For less than a year or maybe a year, almost none are prepared for two years. But most people are prepared for any three days. It, the, you know, the average family... 48 hours. The, the average family in seven days, the last can of beans is gone. Yes, absolutely. You know? Yes. But as far as preppers, people that see what's coming, you know, they say somewhere between three to seven, I mean three to five percent. Of the population see something coming. They even have and a TV preparing. show that makes fun of preppers. Oh yeah, and the so doomsday just preppers. remember, if they're making fun of it, you just might be on the right side. I have been hearing preachers and teachers that believe that we're going to be out of this sooner than later, and I'm hearing more and more of the early rapture people that are now saying you need to get your pantry full. Something might happen. Uh, I was just recently reading a book you recommended that I read, and I've heard this this teacher on TV that he's definitely of the pre, you know, the early exit, mm -hmm. and yet in his book he's talking all kinds of preparation stuff, and and I heard one preacher say that you used to have six weeks, and maybe some are saying as much as six months. I'm not really hearing it, but my question is. What are you going to do after six uh, you weeks? You end the book with the mystery of the seventh, is the it? The seventh Shemitah, yes. And, and, you know, we've been talking about the, the Shemitah. Let me just get, show you. I mean, it's in a few places. It's not just one. It's in, it's in a number of places in the Torah, in the revelation that Moses was given. But one of the places it appears, and you should, it's good to know, is Leviticus 25. So mm -hmm. let, me, let me actually, actually hear, we've been talking about all these things, you know, in the from the stock market to, to, to the world wars and all. Well, here's the beginning of the mystery. In Leviticus 25, the Lord said to Moses at Mount Sinai, tell the people of Israel this, when you enter the land I'm giving you, let it have a special time of rest to honor the Lord. Mm -hmm. You may plant seed in your field for six years. You may trim your vineyards for six years and bring in their fruits. But during the seventh year, you will let the land rest. This will be a time or a Sabbath to honor the Lord. You must not plant seeds in your field or trim your vineyards. You must not cut the crops that grow by themselves after harvest or gather the grapes from your vines that are not trimmed. The land will have a year of rest. It goes on. And if you look, before we go to the next, if you look in the, the next chapter, Leviticus 26, is what it says is, it's, it, it uh, goes on what happens if you break the the law of God. And what it goes on to say, it's in that chapter that it first says that you will be removed from the land and the land will enjoy the Sabbaths or the Shemitahs that, that comes up. So let me, let me now, let's move to another mystery. But okay. it's all, the Shemitahs behind it all. I mean, if, if, in it, so in here it goes right on, Leviticus 25, it goes to verse 8. Now listen what happens to the Shemitah. Okay. Count off seven seven of years, or 49 years. Mm -hmm. During that time, there will be seven years of rest for the land each time. On the day of, okay, this is a different term. On the, on the day of, I want to make sure I'm getting this here. Okay, the day of cleansing. All right, the day of atonement. This is a different right. translation. Yeah. You must sound the shofar. You will sound the shofar on the 10th day of the seventh month. That's the day of Yom Kippur. Uh, and you will, you will sound the shofar throughout the whole land. You will make the 50th year a consecrated year, 
and you will proclaim liberty, freedom for all the people living in your nation. It will be called the Jubilee. You will each go back to your own property, each to your own family and family group. The 50th year will be a consecrated time for you to celebrate. You will not plant seeds for the harvest of the crops, grow by themselves, or gather grapes that are not trimmed. The, it is the year of Jubilee. It will be a holy time for you. You will only eat the crops that come from the field in the year of Jubilee. Each one of you must go back to your own property. If you sell your land to your neighbor, or if you buy land from your neighbor, don't cheat each other if you want to buy your neighbor's land. It goes through the, the, the whole thing. But what it goes on to say, this is the ordinance of the Jubilee. And what it's saying is this. Here's, what's the, the link between the Jubilee and the Shemitah? The Jubilee is really the mega Shemitah. You have seven Shemitahs. So, you know, first you have seven years, you get a Shemitah. You have a uh -huh. Shemitah. Then you have seven Shemitahs, and it becomes the Jubilee. You count to the seventh Shemitah. Mm -hmm. That's 49 years. And then the 50th year is the year of Jubilee. Yes. So here is like, it's the mystery of the Shemitah going to another level. It be, the oh. Shemitah becomes the jubilee but it's a mega jubilee it's a mega shemitah it's a super shemitah in that you have you still have the rest of the land the land rests and all that but not only but it's not just you know not like kind of the letting go of that but literally it's the day it's the year of restoration it would if you've lost something you lost your land in the year of jubilee your land is restored you get uh -huh. it back mm -hmm. um if you if you have lost your inheritance the year of jubilee your inheritance is restored to you. If you've lost your, you know, if it's your father's land, it went down, down, but you blew it, you messed everything up, on the, in the 50th year of Jubilee, you return to your father's land, you return to your family's land, you return to the land that you lost, and everything is restored. It's the ultimate Shemitah. Everything mm. is restored. And if you were in a slave, if you were bound in the year of Jubilee, you are released. It says that you shall be released, and you'll go home to your family. So the Jubilee is the time of freedom, proclaim freedom to the land, uh, proclaim restoration. It's restoration to the land. It's reconciliation. It's, I mean, all the things. It's, it's, the, it's the Shemitah coming to its, its, its ultimate. So it's all about restoration and all that. And it also says you will sound the shofar. The Shemitah begin, or the, well, the Jubilee begins on the day of Yom Kippur, which is interesting. Yom Kippur is about having your sins forgiven, mm -hmm. but once your sins are forgiven, God wants you to celebrate. You know, now comes restoration. Your cleanse now be restored. And so you will sound that shofar all throughout the land. It's a sound of freedom. We have, if you go to Philadelphia and you see the Liberty Bell, the Liberty Bell is really, is really the shofar. It's simply the shofar that was translated into a bell. It has on it this, this scripture really? will proclaim liberty from Leviticus, oh. liberty throughout the land. Oh. That's, that's the Jubilee scripture. It's talking about the shofar, but it became a bell. But it's a shofar. That's, you know, that's a, again, the link with America and Israel. That's the Jubilee. That's clear. That's oh Leviticus right man. there in there. So now the thing is, so now nobody knows when the Jubilee is. Unlike the Shemitah, they know where the Shemitah is. Nobody knows where the Jubilee has been because you can't really trace it. You can come up with things. But we know one thing. The Jubilee always comes after the year of the Shemitah. You have the seventh Shemitah, and then you have the Jubilee. So whenever the Jubilee comes, it has to be after the year of the Shemitah, no matter what. Now, 2,000 years ago, Jerusalem was surrounded by the Roman soldiers. Surrounded. And you, you talk about how God, we, we've seen the mystery of the Shemitah, how God does things on the same exact day. Yes. Well, that was the beginning. Here you have the first temple of Jerusalem, 586 B.C., destroyed on the 9th of Av. And now you have 70 A.D., the Romans destroyed on the exact same day. Uh -huh. The same thing. So here, the Romans come in. Somebody sets the temple on fire. You know, they rush to get the gold and all that. And the temple, not one stone is left upon the other, as Messiah said it would. And, right. so, and so Jerusalem is destroyed. The land is devastated, just like it was in 586. Mm -hmm. the, the Jewish people really lose everything. This is their homeland. This is their inheritance. This is their father's land. This is their land. You know, despite what the Romans did is they said, well, we're now going to change the name of the land, and we're going to call it Palestina. We're going to name it after the Philistines. Because oh. we want the world to forget that Israel had that land. So mm -hmm. they said, let's go back, and we'll call wow. it by the name of the Philistines. So they called the name of the land the land of the Philistines. The enemies yeah. of Israel. Yeah. 
The enemy always, well, the enemy, that, yeah, because the enemy of Israel wants Israel never to come back to that land. Oh and so he, he took that name. And so the name Palestine simply means Philistine, the land of the Philistines. And this has been for, for 2,000 years. You know, if you go, there, there are a lot of church maps, I mean, early before, that say, you know, the, it says, you've probably seen it. It says the land of Palestine in the time of Jesus. There was no land of Palestine in the time of Jesus. It was Israel. It was Judea. It was the land. It was never mm -hmm. Palestine. It only became that because the enemy wanted it to be erased that the Jewish people had any inheritance of the land because when they come back, everything's happened. So, so here it is to wipe out that thing. Now, so the Jewish people go into exile from the land. Same thing that's in the Shemitah, you know, in the warning, if you go against me, you will be driven from the land. So they're driven, but not just to Babylon, they're driven to the ends of the earth. Yes. I mean, this changes everything. Driven to Europe, Africa, India, America, New York. Why are there any Jews in New York? When you turn on your television, you see Jewish people. It's because of this. It's because it goes back to the Romans. It's because of what Jesus prophesied would happen. He said, you will be taken, led captive into all the nations. Mm -hmm. And you will have, your peace will be hidden from you. Your shalom. See, to this day, we're talking about what's mm -hmm. happening, mm -hmm. the things in Israel. The shalom, what Jesus said, Yeshua, 2,000 years ago, is coming true. That your peace is still hidden from you after 2,000 years. So they wander the earth. And everything the Bible said, if you want another proof of God, everything the Bible said has come true. He says you will, be, you will be led from nation to nation. The sword will follow you. Nation to nation, you will be persecuted in, in all your days until the, end of, until the end days. In the end days, God says, I will gather you back and put you back in the land. Yes. So here you have the beginning of the loss of everything. Now, Yeshua, Jesus said to them, he said, you will not see me again, Jerusalem, basically until Jewish people, until, until you say, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, for that to come true, just that little thing, four things at least had to happen. One is the Jewish people had to survive. I mean, that was against all odds. Yeah. No Boy, people, a, no oh people have ever been taken from their land totally, persecuted throughout the world, no nation, no army, no defense, no police, nothing, for two, and survived for 2,000 years as a nation. No people, no people. But God said they would survive. God said, as long as I live, as long as this is, you're my witness, nothing's going to wipe you out. All the forces of hell tried to destroy them, yet to this day, it's a miracle that the Jewish people still live. I mean, that's a miracle to begin with. Yes. You, know, you, you could go to, you know, where we are, you can go to the Metropolitan Museum, and you'll find, all, you'll find the Assyrian, you'll find the Hittite, you'll find all these ancient people who were, who were there with the Jewish people back then, and that you can only find them in museums today. You go to the, you'll find them in museums, they're stone. But if you go, to, you'll, you go to the same museum, you'll find Jewish people walking around those museums. They're still alive. The yeah. nation of Israel lives. You know, because God said that's they would God. live. That's great. Yeah. That's True. amazing. So, so that, that, that's the sign of our God. So they are, they're alive. They live. And then, but that's not, that's not just it. It says then they would have to come back to the land in order to say what Messiah said they have to say. So they had to come back to the land. For 2,000 years, People said, there's no way the Jewish people are coming back to the land. That's never, never happened before, a nation coming back to this land. Even church people, even supposed Christians said, it's never going to happen. God is finished with Israel. God's replaced Israel. The Jewish people are finished. The church is now replacing Israel. I mean, that, that was the main teaching, you know. And yet, yet there was a few faithful people who said, you know what? The Bible says the Jewish people are coming back to the land of Israel, so we believe it. It's going to happen. Even the American Puritans in mm -hmm. this, who founded this country believed the Jewish people were going to be restored in one way or the other. So, so here, you know, that, that has to happen for this to come. But it, that's not enough. They have to also be restored to Jerusalem because Jesus said, you, you will say this. He's talking to them in Jerusalem. So they have to come back to Jerusalem and, you know, and, and for this to all come true. It's got, so they have to be restored to all these things. And then they have to also, you could add into this, they have to speak Hebrew again because he's quoting from the scriptures, which is in Hebrew, Baruch haba, Bashem Adonai. So even the language of Hebrew has to come back into existence just to, so they can say Baruch haba, blessed is he. <laughs> and even that, there's no nation, there's actually no language that was totally dead, totally dead, and then was resurrected from nothing. Mm -hmm. And really it was one man who was responsible there's a man named Eliezer ben Yehuda. His actual name means Lazarus, the one who was resurrected. And ah. he's a Jewish man, and he said he, had a, he heard a voice, basically from God, saying that, talked about the resurrection of Israel, and this single one man 
was responsible for resurrecting a language that was dead. And make, he wrote a dictionary before there was a language. He wrote a, di- you know, you'll have a, you have a language, then you have a dictionary. He wrote a dictionary, and the language came from the dictionary. Israel's the only, only nation in the world where the children taught the parents how to speak the language. <laughs> because they came from all over the earth. So it was the children who spoke that. So, so God was resurrected. So even that. And the last thing is ultimately is the Jewish people have to come back to Messiah to order to say it. And you're watching that now. You're watching yes, Jewish you're people. Sitting here. I'm one of them. <laughs> so, so, well, let, let, me just, let, me just, let me just throw this in. And it, it, we're gonna, this is all part of the seven spring time. But when I came to the Lord, you know, and you know I was hit by a locomotive train to get me to get m- my attention. I was literally hit by a train. Literally. Literally. A train came, you know, and everything was destroyed. I called out to God. The car was gone. I didn't get a scratch. So I said, God, you're getting my attention, you know. <laughs> and so, and so, so at the end, I finally went up this mountain. I kneeled down on a rock. I didn't know how to give myself. I didn't know anything how to do this. I kneeled down. I gave my life to the Lord on this rock on top of a mountain. Because I remember in Hebrew school, God did things on mountains. That's all I knew. So <laughs> I found a mountain in New York. I found a mountain, you know, went up there in the middle of the night. Well, it was dawn by the time I got up there. And then kneeled down on this rock. And I found out later, you know, it was, it was years later after I was saved for years. And the Lord had always led me in the nations to these mountains, these cursed mountains where there was voodoo going on or witchcraft going on. He would do like an amazing thing all throughout the world. But I, it was my anniversary of being in the Lord. And I said, let me go back to that mountain. So I went back to the mountain. It was, I had a flashlight. I had a tali, you know, a prayer shawl. I had a, a shofar. And I, I sound the trump. I go back. I find the rock where I get, gave my life to the Lord. It's night. And, you know, I have a great time with the Lord and the whole, and it sounded the trumpet. And the next day, I go to the service, and someone says, oh, I have a birthday gift. Because I was saved on my birthday. It was my, we'll go into my Ooh. 20th birthday. Because I, I said, God, I'll, okay, give me till I'm 20, and I'll accept you. Just don't kill me. And, <laughs> and, and that, that's why. So I'm saved on my birthday. So, so, I, I find, so I go back, go to the service the next day, and someone says, I have a birthday gift for you. And they show me, a, it's a drawing of a man on a mountaintop wearing a prayer shawl, sounding a shofar. I said, that's strange. I said, because that's where I was. That was me last night. They said, they said, I was on a mountain. I said, where I got saved. They said, where'd you get saved? I said, well, you don't know. It's just on some mountain. They said, no, tell me. I describe it. The, the, there was a woman. She says, I live at the bottom of that mountain. I said, really? And she said, do you know what that mountain is? I said, no. She said, that mountain is dedicated to Satan. Uh... I said, really? I said, well, I got saved on the top. He said, well, that's where they meet. That's where, the, where they have their things. Mm-hmm. I said, really? I said, well, well I, I kneeled down on a rock. There and gave my life. They said, That's the altar. I said, Really? And then it made sense because when I had left that mountain, I saw, or when I came there, I saw on the ground it had words written on the ground. And the words said, and it never made any sense to me until that moment, until years later, the mystery. Mm-hmm. It said, No Jew shall enter these sacred grounds. Mm. Yeah. Wow. 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 Powerful. And I, I said, I, who on earth would write something like that? I mean, are, they, are there Nazis? I mean, who, who would write that? Yeah. Satan worshipers would write that. Yeah. But I took it as something else because it was the enemy saying to the Jewish, saying, I've kept you. I, I, no Jew shall enter. The, these are the grounds that I came to the Lord. I came back to my Messiah. The, Jew, the enemy has been trying to stop the Jewish people from coming back to the Messiah for 2,000 years. Right. So yeah. I said, too late, Satan. I'm already in. Yeah. I already got in. <laughs> and it glad. And and so, and so, so the enemy has not only he's been tr- keeping the Jewish people from their Messiah. That's their inheritance to come back to their Messiah, and keeping them from their land and from Jerusalem. For two thousand years, you had every other power. The Romans came in, took the land, renamed it. Then the Bi- the Byzantines took it. Then the Arabs, uh, the Islamic Arab armies took it. Then the Crusaders took it. You know, people think, hey, Crusaders, it was a great thing. Mm-hmm. For Jewish people, when they hear crusade, yeah. they think of killing Jews because that's what they did exactly. on the way there. So but they, but they say the Crusaders had it. Then the, the, the Islamic Arab army or Islamic armies took it back. Then finally the Ottoman Empire took it back. So all these, all these people kept taking the land of Israel except the Jewish people. The Jewish people had no land, and then all these people had the land, and the land was cursed because God said the land's going to be cursed. And all, these, and all these different powers 
tr- they went back to the land and they tried to farm the, they, some of them tried to farm the land. It would never grow. It was a land that could not grow at all. The Jewish people were known around the world. They never had, they didn't have land. They were known as the people who couldn't grow anything. No matter what they did, they couldn't grow. When you took the people who couldn't grow anything back to the land that couldn't be grown, what happens? The land blossoms oh, right. <laughs> like a rose in the desert. Wow. You know, it's true. Amazing. True. So, I mean, even when, you know, when, when, when Mark Twain went to Israel, you know, he said, this land is the most cursed land in the world. God has cursed it. It'll never be, it'll never be alive again. There's nothing like the curse of this land. It's like, you know, and if the Bible says that he fulfilled prophecy, because the Bible says in, in the Torah, it says that strangers will come from around the world and will come to that land and say, what has, what has God done to curse this land? So Mark Twain actually fulfilled that. And yet that God, but here's the thing. God promised he would redeem the land, he would restore his people. Mm-hmm. So here's what happens now. Here's the prophecy. The land is in the, is in the grip of the Ottoman Empire, which is Islamic, Turkey. They're Islamic. They're not about to give the Jewish people anything. But God said he would bring them back to the land. So here's what happens. Okay, you have, you have what happens is the First World War. And what happens is the Ottoman Empire gets into the war and goes against England and France and ultimately America. And so what happens is the Ottoman Empire, remember the Shemitah? Collapses. It's the year of the Shemitah. It's 1917. The Ottoman Empire collapses. The British Empire is moving into the Middle East. Now, there was a, a little boy who was a British boy, and every year, I mean, every day, he was taught by his mother, whenever you pray your prayers, you must pray at the end for God to restore his ancient people to their land. This little boy. Because there was a revival in England, and there was a love for Israel for, for that time. So this little boy, every day of his life, would pray that. Just take, take, cut it there. It's World War I. The, the English army is, is heading to Jerusalem under General Allenby. Allenby heads to Jerusalem, and when he gets there, there's no fight because what happened is the people, the Muslims, they misinterpret his name. They heard Allenby, and they thought Allah, Navi, the prophet of Allah, is coming to bring judgment, so they fled. Oh, so when Allenby got to Jerusalem, there was nothing. There was, it was there, and he entered Jerusalem. He got off his horse. He said his Lord had come on a donkey. He could not ride in on a horse. So he walked into Jerusalem, and, Israel, and the British Empire now had Israel. Okay, this is the beginning. Now, now, Allenby was the little boy who used to pray every day, the Lord restore the land to your ancient people. Oh, my. God used the little boy. He didn't even want to go be, he didn't want to be a soldier. He used the little boy to end up restoring the land for the Jewish people. So England got the land, and they said because there was a a lot of incredible events that happened by God's hand, they end up issuing the Balfour Declaration. Very important. They said, Her Majesty's government views with favor the establishment of a homeland for the Jewish people. In other words, we're going to give the land to the Jewish people. After 2,000 years, 2,000 years, the first restoration happens then, happens in that year. The Jewish people are restored to our beginning. It's going to be their land, restored to the land. They, think of Jubilee now. Everyone shall return, to, they shall return to the land of their inheritance, shall return to the land of their fathers, to return to their home. And the Jubilee, those who were in prison, those who are in chains are set free and they go home. So this is like the jubilee of Israel, okay? But now remember the mystery here. The jubilee is linked to the mystery of the Shemitah. The jubilee must always happen the year after following the Shemitah. What happens, when did this take place? It happened in the autumn of 1917. The Shemitah was 1916 to 1917, ended in the autumn then would come the Jubilee. The restoration of Israel began the year after the Shemitah, which is what the Jubilee, when the Jubilee has to come. The restoration has to come. So here you have the first restoration of Israel, the land. But it's not finished because it cannot be complete until they have Jerusalem. In 1948, they became a nation, but it wasn't so much gaining more land, it was nationhood. But the next restoration would happen after this. What would happen is, the year is 1967, and e- the, e- Egypt says we're going to 
we're going to destroy Israel. They say they ask the UN remove your troops because remove your troops so we can invade. The UN, of course, happily or I won't say happily, but the UN obliges, removes their troops. So now Israel is all surrounded all around the the Islamic world. They're talking about destroying Israel. The troops are massing all around Israel. Israel decide, says, you know, we to survive, we're going to have to we're going to have to strike. So they strike. What happens? It's called the Six Day War. Mm. At the at the at the end of that time. What happens is that, it, that, that Israel, this is, this is in June 1967, you see, Jordan had the land there. Jordan had the land of Israel. What General Mordecai Gur announces, announces, we are sitting on the ridge and we can see the old city. Shortly we shall go into the old city of Jerusalem that all generations have dreamed about. This is the general, I mean, talking like prophetic. The Israeli soldiers enter the lion's gate, for the first time in 2,000 years, there are Israeli soldiers in the holy city of Jerusalem. They advance to the Temple Mount. They advance to the Western Wall. And there they look. Sometimes you might, might see those pictures. The Israeli soldiers are looking at the wall, and they, they, they're weeping. They're, they're taking off their hats, their, uh, their, their helmets. They're weeping. And with that, spontaneously, they begin to recite the ancient prayer, Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who has sustained us, who has preserved us, and has enabled us to reach this day. They are then joined by the Rabbi Gorin, who says to them, he says, the vision of all generations is being realized before our eyes. The city of God, the city of the temple, the symbol of our nation's redemption has now been redeemed. 1967, for prophecy to come true, they had to be restored to Jerusalem for Jesus' words. He cannot come again until Jewish people are in Jerusalem. For the first time in 2,000 years, the holy city is in the hands of the Jewish people again. They are restored to their key moment. It's the second great restoration of, for the Jewish people. It's another return. They are returning to their home, to their possession in Jerusalem, to their inheritance, and when did it take place? 1967. Well, here's the mystery. The mystery of the Shemitah and the Jubilee. The Jubilee must follow, the restoration must follow the year of the Shemitah. When was the Shemitah? The Shemitah was 1965 to September 1966. The next period is the year following the Shemitah, the Jubilee. So here you have the two restorations of Israel in, our t- in prophecy. They each happen the year after the Shemitah, which is what the Jubilee, the restoration. But it's even more than that. Now, now go further. 1917, count seven Shemitahs. Okay, count seven Shemitahs. It brings you to 1967, or actually 66 and then 67. It's not only that it was the year after the Shemitah. It's the exact time period. It's the seventh Shemitah. Wow. It's the Jubilee. <laughs> it's 49 years plus one. It, it is the, the two wow. restorations of Israel in our lifetime. Follow the mystery of the Shemitah and follow the Jubilee. The, the, the restorate, each one shall return home, all those things. And, but let me even go further. When the Jubilee happens, you're going to sound the shofar. Could there be any link to the shofar, the sounding shofar, to the Jubilee, to this, to this prophetic Jubilee? And, and here's the thing. When, when the British ruled the land... They, they turned kind of against Israel at one point, and they made it illegal to blow the shofar at the Temple Mount, at, at the Western Wall. It's illegal. But Jewish people, from 1930 on, you'd always have a Jewish, Jewish young men made an oath that no matter what happens, we're going to blow the shofar every year at the Western Wall. So they would, and the, the day that they would try to blow it was Yom Kippur, which is also the day that the Jubilee begins. Of all the days, it's like, uh, so they would do it, they'd get arrested. They, they'd blow the shofar, they, they, they'd go for one, another person would blow the shofar they, for, for years until, you know, then Jordan took it, nobody blew any shofar, you could, there was no, no sign of it. But here's the thing, when those Israeli soldiers reached that wall, right behind them was a rabbi, this Rabbi Goren, a very famous guy, and he came to the war, somebody actually had a dream that he was going to do something, he came to the wall right with those soldiers, and he carried a shofar with him. <laughs> and at the wall, it was 1967, one of the most famous pictures, of famous shofar blowings in, the, in history. He sounded the shofar in 1967 at the wall at that moment, 
in and which was the 50th year, the seventh jubil, the seventh Shemitah from the restoration. The mystery is not only the mystery of the Shemitah is behind prophecy, behind the end times, behind everything. And I'll just throw this in, and I'm not, I'm not saying things have to happen. You know me. Yes. But I'm just throwing this in. If you count, when is the next one? 1967 plus 49 years. Now, when is, when is the, or let's take 65 and 66 for the Shemitah. Go, go to the seventh Shemitah. You come out to 2014 and 15. That's the seventh Shemitah from the, you have 1917, 1967. And then the year after the Shemitah is, would be that year would be 2015 to 16. So I'm just throwing that in. Just throwing Whoa. that in. <laughs> wow. wow. Just throw it in, Rabbi. Just Boy, throw that it is in, amazing. That's Mystery of the Shemitah. Amazing. That gives it us. It continues. Yeah. Wow. Get the book to read all the details. Okay. And, and this brand new book, The Mystery of the Shemitah, is just That's... out in the last 48 hours. If you want to order yours for a gift of $10, we want to ship it to you right away. Just call the 800 number. It's toll free. And get a couple of them at least, or if you want a whole baker's dozen, that's 12 plus 1 is 13. Well, for a $100 gift, you can share it with others. But this, this is what's in this book, what you're hearing. Powerful. This is what this book is all it's about. It's powerful. It's it mind-boggling. Is, it powerful is a roadmap job. to where it we is. are living it at is. this moment. And we, in the next few 